This is going to be Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to look at the subject of Would you survive in Noah's day? Now, reading Genesis chapter 6, we can see that Noah lived in some crazy times, and the Lord said the tribulation would be as it were in the days of Noah. So if you think these things in Genesis 6 would be hard to handle, then you might want to make sure you're saved and leaving in the rapture, which is going to take all Christians out before the tribu tribulation begins. So some things I'm going to cover in this chapter are some things that people might get upset over, but really it's these things aren't that big of a deal. Uh, the topic of the sons of God is a controversial topic, and some questions to ask, ask yourself as you listen to this study is, why do I believe what I believe about the sons of God? Ask yourself that. Is it because you have Bible to back it up? Is it because you don't want to look like a nut to people? Or is it because what I'm going to teach is hard to believe? Ask yourself these questions and just let the scriptures bring you to the truth. And if you disagree with what I'm saying, that's perfectly fine. I believe everyone has their right to believe what they want to believe. And if you think the scriptures back up what you're teaching, then that's fine too. But now to survive Noah's day, you're going to have to deal with giants. Let's look at these giants and where they came from. It says in Genesis 6-1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Now, something first I'd like to point out before we keep reading is that this verse mentions having daughters and not sons. And obviously, men were having boys and girls, but the, the focus in this verse is on the daughters of men and not the sons of men. Notice it says, and daughters were born unto them. It doesn't say, and sons were born unto them. It's showing you the focus is on the daughters of men. And that is something that you just notice right off the bat in verse 1. When it comes to men, in this chapter, we are dealing with their daughters and not their sons. So, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, I'd also like to point out that there is a distinction here. Here you have sons of God and daughters of men. So the verse makes a distinction. And a com common interpretation of, of this is that the sons of God are saved people from the godly line of Seth. And that the sons of God are just saved men and the daughters of men are lost people. But where exactly do you find the godly line of Seth in the Bible? And another question arises, why would it only be lost women, the daughters of men, marrying saved men, the sons of God? And if you believe the sons of God are saved men in the Old Testament, there's a couple other questions that will come up that I would like for you to think about. But most of you guys that are listening, I'm guessing believe the Old Testament saints went to paradise in the heart of the earth when they died while they would wait on Jesus Christ to shed his blood. So you believe Old Testament saints went to the heart of the earth and not to the third heaven where God is. But if the sons of God are just saved people in the Old Testament and they went to paradise, which I believe they went to paradise on the heart of the earth, so if you believe that, but you also believe that the sons of God are saved people, referring to saved people in the Old Testament, then why are they presenting themselves before the Lord with the devil in the third heaven in the Old Testament in Job chapter 1 and verse 6, which says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And that's a question you need to ask yourself. Why are the sons of God with the devil present before the Lord if you believe sons of God went to paradise in the heart of the earth. Now there are people who have completely changed their views and they they put Old Testament saints in the third heaven. Uh, 
one of the reasons is because of this verse. They say that they didn't go to paradise in the heart of the earth. But I believe that the Old Testament saints couldn't get to the third heaven without the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're in paradise in the heart of the earth in the Old Testament. So this is one reason why I believe that the sons of God in the Old Testament refers to the angels and not to saved people. But that's a question you need to ask yourself. If you believe the sons of God are saved people, but you also believe they went to paradise in the heart of the earth like I do, then how are they presenting themselves before the Lord in Job chapter 1 and verse 6? Also, if the sons of God are just saved people in the Old Testament, then why are they here before Adam was even created? If you look at Job 38, 5 through 7, it says, Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone, cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So you have sons of God shouting for joy when God laid the foundation of, of the earth. And if sons of God is just saved people from the godly line of Seth then how are they here before Adam was even created? And that's another question that arises. For example, if you maybe you believe in Job chapter 1 and verse 6 that that's just safe people presenting themselves before the Lord through prayer. If that's what you believe, then you know I, I'll accept that. But what about in Job 38 with them here before Adam's created? So it seems that the sons of God are here when God laid the foundations of the earth and it would have to be referring to the angels so if the sons of God is just the godly line of Seth then why were they here before Adam that's another question to ask yourself and I've I've looked on both sides of the argument and some will bring up Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5 which says for unto which of the angels said he at any time thou art my son this day have I begotten thee and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. You see, they'll say it's, it says the Lord never called the angels sons. But read it again. You're having to leave stuff out to, to teach that. Is it because you don't want to believe something that is hard to believe, or do you really believe what you're saying? You don't want to believe something that might make someone think you're crazy. Is that why you believe what you believe? Ask yourself that. But it says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Angels aren't begotten sons. Job or John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Angels are sons of God, but not begotten sons. And to make Hebrews 1.5 teach that angels aren't sons, you would have to just remove part of the verse which says thou art my son this day have I begotten thee he didn't say that they weren't sons he's saying they aren't begotten sons and then another one people might use is John 1 12 which says but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name and yes of course I'm not denying that we born again believers are sons of God but there's no question about that whatsoever. And Adam is also called the Son of God and, and a Son of God in Luke 3. But that is because he was a direct creation of God. And there was no man that Adam came from to be called a son of other than God. So it seems that sons of God in the Bible are beings that are created sinless. Adam was created sinless. When you're born again... The new man in you is sinless. And the angels are created sinless. And obviously there are different types of sons of God. With Jesus Christ being something different entirely because he is the only begotten son of God. And don't get it confused. Jesus Christ is the eternal God. He's always been here. But the man, Christ Jesus, was begotten. And he's the only begotten son. And another question arises about angels being male female or sexless and if you search angels in the bible you will see that every time they show up they show up as male uh, 
in Matthew 22:30, many people will take you here because, you know, they'll say, well, you know, the sons of God couldn't be angels because they don't get married. Because in Genesis 6, they're taking themselves wives. But in Matthew 22, 30, it says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And many will use this to prove that angels are sexless. But once again, you have to ignore some of the verse because... And also the verse doesn't say they're sexless. It just says they don't marry. And many people today don't get married, even today, but... But the part which says, as the angels of God in heaven, also has to be ignored to prove that no angel gets married because there are angels which aren't, that aren't in heaven. There's angels which kept not their first estate. And you, you can read about these in the book of Jude, verses 6 through 7. And it, it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, and to the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So Jude shows us that some angels left their first estate and also puts them in conversation with fornication and strange flesh, which seems to be what happened in Genesis 6 because... You have in Genesis or in Jude six, the angels which kept not the first estate, and then it says in like manner, with Sodom and Gomorrah giving themselves over to fornication. So it says in like manner as Sodom and Gomorrah. So there you have angels which kept not the first estate and fornication, in the same, in the same context here. Now Genesis six three, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Now notice the phrase, he also is flesh. And he won't strive with man. It says he won't strive with man because he also is flesh, showing that there is someone else besides man that is flesh. Why does it say he also is flesh? If there's not something, some other being around. The part that says, my spirit shall not always strive with man, is many times used to prove that God will reach a point where he will no longer save a person. And they might teach that a man can cross a deadline and that God will no longer give him the opportunity to be saved and believe the gospel. But the context of this has nothing to do with salvation of the soul. That also contradicts salvation because the Lord always strives with man in regards to salvation. It's all about his grace and mercy. And you're taking a Old Testament passage from Genesis and trying to throw that on the church age. So today, the Spirit of God always strives with man. You know, as long as you got breath, there's a chance for you to be saved. Now, Genesis 6, 4 says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. And they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So when were there giants? When the sons of God came in into the daughters of men and also after that. So from the time of their conception and even after the flood. So the same situation probably happened again to a lesser extent after the flood. And this is going to happen again in the tribulation. Because if you look at Daniel 2.43, it says, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. So what is mixing themselves with the seed of men? So this doctrine is definitely in the Bible. And it's a pretty important doctrine because you mess up the Bible dispensationally by teaching the sons of God are saved men from a godly line. So angels left their first estate. They are all male, in the Bible at least. For example, see the story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, and you'll see young. the angels are referred to as young men. But there's angels that left their first estate, and these angels die like men 
Psalms 82, 6 and 7 says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Notice that, children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So these are children, sons, and he calls them gods. And it says, you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. When they left their first estate, they... It causes them to die like men. So would you survive Noah's day with the giants roaming the earth and these fallen angels roaming the earth? Next, would you survive Noah's day with great wickedness in the land? Genesis 6, 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You know, they said Ted Bundy was extremely wicked, shockingly evil and vile. And that's what I am. And that's what you are. Man is wicked. And the Bible says so here in this verse. Jesus says man is evil. Matthew seven twenty one through 23 says, For from within, out of the heart men of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Jesus says we're evil. In Philippians 3.21, Paul says we have a vile body. The imaginations and thoughts of man is what gets him in trouble. It starts with a thought. It starts with looking at something you aren't supposed to be looking at, and then you think about what you saw, and then you act out on what you're thinking. Ted Bundy said he blames pornography for getting him started on his murder rape. And don't think for a second that uh, pornography couldn't cause you to be a sick, twisted pervert or sodomite or just a, just a murder-rape serial killer. Uh, we are extremely evil, extremely wicked, shockingly evil and vile. We're no different than he was. We have the same flesh he did. And it's by the grace of God we don't turn out like he does. But you think about surviving Noah's time, such a wicked time with such wicked people roaming around that only eight of them had enough sense to get in out of the rain, literally. And it seems Noah and his family are the only ones righteous because they're the only ones that didn't miss the boat, literally. And you need to think about the population. You have people that's having a lot of kids... And also, men are living up to be up into their 900s, so you have billions of wicked people walking around with giants. Could you survive Noah's day? Jesus Christ said that the love of men in the tribulation would wax cold. And he said it would be as it were in the days of Noah, so I imagine the love of men were waxing cold. And Noah probably had a street preaching sign that said, Don't miss the boat. He probably had on one of those bright yellow t-shirts that the street preachers always wear that said a storm is coming. Sinners need to get right. He was probably handing out free arc tickets for tracks. He probably tried to persuade them with a free tour of the ark and let them walk in it like that thing Ken Ham, at, Ken Ham has in Kentucky. And the atheist probably said, how are you going to get all them animals on this ark? asking stupid, foolish questions because they don't want to believe in God. And if they probably did believe in God, but they acted like they didn't. Just like a lot of people today, they're atheists in practice. Genesis 6, 5 through 6, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented, repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So you can grieve the God of heaven that made everything. Noah probably had a street preaching sign that said, Don't miss the boat. He probably had one of those bright yellow t-shirts that you see all the street preachers wear that said a storm is coming, sinners you need to get right, or something like that. He was probably handing out free ark tickets for tracks, just begging people to board the ark with him. He probably tried to persuade them with a free tour and let them walk in it like at that Ken Ham ark in Kentucky. And the atheists or the atheists in practice probably said, how are you going to get all them animals on this ark? 
because people probably weren't atheists back then because they seen so much stuff that was just otherworldly. But they were atheists in practice in that they believed in God, but they probably just acted like there was no God, like they were their own God. But Genesis 6, 5 through 6 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So you can grieve the God of heaven that made everything. It's mind-blowing if you think about it. Because when you look down at an ant on the ground, do you get enough of affection toward the ant that you would care what it did? The Bible says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? The eternal God loves man so much that he's grieved when they disobey him. But you can grieve the Holy Spirit in you. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Genesis 6, 7 says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And this is where you get the saying, wiped off the face of the earth. It says, He's going to destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. But man was just a bunch of zits and pimples and blackheads, and the Lord was just going to wipe them off the face of the earth. All those lost sinners were serpents in the eyes of God with pus running out. I mean, in the eyes of God, a sinner is nasty. You need salvation. The Bible says uh, that wrath is abiding on you. It says, He that believeth on the Son hath life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And and this verse has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I just thought of it. Jeremiah 16, 4, it says, They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented, neither shall they be buried. But they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth, and they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. God said that. That's what he does to a bunch of disobedient rebels at heart. He said they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth. He said it's not even worth burying them because they aren't fit to kill. They aren't worth shooting. And the closer you get to God, the more you will realize that we're nothing. Some preachers you watch don't realize that. They don't realize how wicked they are. They're so used to being a Christian and they're so used to looking down on everybody. They have their heads stuck up so far in the clouds and the men who amen them when they get on this big ego trip rant are just feeding the fire. The big shot preachers or sinners, they breathe, their breath stinks just like you. And when they get out of the bathroom, it stinks. They have some of these big meetings and it looks like a Hollywood celebrity is up there. He makes serving God look like it's glamorous and that, you know, everybody loves you or something. I mean, they call his name to come up there to preach, and he comes up there, and they give him about a 15-minute standing ovation. But if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, he'd be on his way to hell just like any lost drunk laying in some alley in his own vomit. And if that lost drunk gets saved today, then he's just as good as the big shot preacher. Uh, Genesis 6, 7 says, And the Lord said, I would destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So the Lord is going to destroy man with a flood. Deuteronomy 28, 63 says, And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And you shall be plucked up from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And that has nothing to do with this chapter. Once again, I just thought about it. That's a scary verse. Since God is holy and just, He rejoices over righteous destruction of a person who's wicked. And these people aren't considering their latter end. They aren't considering what it's like to fall in the hands of an angry God who is a consuming fire. Now, Genesis 6, 7, it says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So God is going to wipe out a bunch of animals. He doesn't care about PETA or PETA, however you say it. What does PETA stand for anyway? 
someone stands it stands for someone said it stands for people eating tasty animals so if that's what I, that's what it stands for i like it but so the lord said for it repenteth me that i have made them so here repentance is about feeling sorry he's sorry he made man and sometimes repent is used as a change of mind in Exodus 32, 14, it says, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. But Genesis 6, 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah found grace. In the New Testament, grace finds you. And a lot of people teach that dispensationalists like myself don't believe there was grace in the Old Testament. But of course there was. If it wasn't for God's grace and mercy, then every Old Testament saint would have went to hell. It's just that Noah wasn't looking forward to the cross. Even though the ark was a type of Jesus Christ, as you will see soon. But if you think that he was saved by looking forward to the cross, then ask yourself a few questions here. If you think he was his salvation is just like ours. Number one, why didn't he go to the third heaven when he died like we do? Number two, how did he know the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15 when the disciples didn't even know it? And number three, how could he have his sins washed in the blood when the blood of Jesus Christ hadn't even been shed? So it's not that Noah was saved by works in the sense that his works gained him eternal life and a place in heaven. It's that Noah did what God said and God let him go to paradise for this reason in the heart of the earth while he would wait on the blood of Christ to be shed. So instead of Noah being saved by works, it's more like he was safe by his own works. Noah, was, Noah had his own righteousness that got him to paradise in the heart of the earth. But the righteousness wasn't good enough. Ezekiel 14.20 shows us that he had his own righteousness. It says, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, said the Lord, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls, by their righteousness so you say you say well our own righteousness can't get us to heaven exactly i'm not saying that but noah is said to deliver his own soul by his righteousness noah didn't have the imputed righteousness of jesus christ before jesus christ even came to fulfill our righteousness but he had his own noah had his own righteousness that allowed him by god's mercy and grace to get to paradise in the heart of the earth while he would wait on true salvation. It's not that they were saved by works in the sense they got eternal life in a spot in heaven by their own works. That's not what we're saying. Now, Genesis 6, 9, it says, there are the, These are generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Can you walk with God when everything around you is wicked? 